Welcome to the RPG Players Guild. My name is Gordon Jackson and today I want to talk about uh, training time. I just recently did a video on uh, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything has a an, a optional feature where you can change changing your subclass and one of the sections in there talks about training time if you were going to do that. So in prepping and doing some research for that video which was enough to make my brain bleed um, you know looking at training time as far as like what are the rules on training time when we talk about training it's going to be dependent on the campaign and it's really it's all DM and here's the thing about training time is is that you can play with in one campaign and play with one DM and this is how they treat training maybe it's super important maybe it's not as important or if it is important, this is how much it, we charge and this is what you got to do. And then you play with a different DM and it's totally different. And you're like, well, you know, this is how we played it before. And you're just homebrewing that shit. This is no, there. The rules on training, in my opinion, are left very vague by by Wizards of the Coast and in and, and the D&D books because it's it's based off of what your DM wants to do. It gives your DM the ability to figure out how important it's going to be or how much time it's going to take or how much money or are you going to have to buy your way in or do you have to have certain things before you can get that kind of training. And that is what role playing is all about. So this isn't one of those things that's written in stone like combat skills, which is why a lot of people like to do combat a lot because those skills and those mechanics are pretty much written in stone. We have rules as written for how those mechanics are gonna work and they have a place you can fit them in. It's not to say that they can't be complex or that there can't be like, well, how does that really work? And we have to do some research to find out like, you know, how does it really work? Maybe I was looking at it wrong, but that's literally how it works. With training, to gain a proficiency or to gain a skill or to, um, get to that next level of what you want to do. Like, does your DM require you, like in old D&D, to go up in levels, you had to ha put in a certain amount of training time. You know, in, in Dungeons & Dragons 5e, it's not, you don't have to do that. But in old D&D, if you wanted to go up to the next level, you had to put some time at the training hall. You had to go practice that stuff. You had to go back to the Wizards College or go back to your mentor. And, and, and you had to put in some time in order to train. And so from one game to the next, one DM to the next, it's going to be different. And it's not homebrew. And, and I, homebrew is a four letter word in D&D and a lot of people throw out, well, you're just homebrewing that shit. Well, guess what? The mass majority of the game when we're role playing is homebrewing that shit. <laughs> And so D&D gives you some options to kind of get you started on what training is going to be, but it's totally up to your DM on how to do it. Your DM may go, hey, you know, this is, this is how we play training in this game, or this is how important it is in this game. But let's look at what D&D has. And starting off with just like if you were changing your subclass, on this particular subject, how Dungeons & Dragons looks at training. So the DM might require you to, an expenditure of money to pay for training, Magical reagents or other goods needed for the transition. The cost is typically typically 100 gold pieces for, for your new level. Um, the cost might be accomplished by a quest of some sort. For example, a sorcerer wants to adopt a draconic bloodline could be required to receive blood or blessing or, from a, or both from an ancient dragon. The training requirement here is, is that it requires a number, number equal to twice your new level in a class. So if you were 10th level and you were trying to change your subclass, you would have to train for 20 days. Now, I've done some research on like what is a day in Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm not talking about like, you know, what's a day? We all know what a day is. But like hour wise, you know, I would think that for ease, not every planet out there has the same days as Earth. But trying to keep it so that we all have some point of reference so that we don't have to remember it. We have a 24-hour day. Are they talking about when you talk about a day of training as 24-hour day? In my mind, I think of it as like a work day. So you have eight hours worth of training. You had to spend eight hours. Maybe not all of it was in the field. Maybe some of it was in the classroom. And you, But you spent eight hours. If you think about in the real world, in an eight-hour day, 
we have 365 days in a year and if you're an American you're working you're working five days a week and we have 52 weeks in a year so it'd be five times 52 it'd be 260 days in a year so there's 260 days in a year other than weekends 260 days so if it tells you you're gonna do um, 20 days worth of training in order to get that then you're talking about 28 hour days and it could take you longer like hey I could only I got some other stuff going today and I only practiced for four hours does that count you know so it, your DM is gonna have to decide like does 20 days mean 20 days or does 20 days mean um, it could take you 40 days because you're only working a half a day you know or how does that work so that right there can be a little bit subjective on how you want to work out days Let's look at another thing that DM, or Dungeons and Dragons talks about training. So on page 131 of the Dungeon Master Guide, training to gain levels. So this is why I was talking about a variant role and you can use this as a variant role. You can require characters to spend downtime training or studying before they gain the benefits of a new level. Now, there's some contradictory rules in there that if you gain a new level, you gain it instantly. So if you're in a dungeon, you're in the middle of a dungeon, you gain that instantly. You know, you could, as a DM, if you wanted to use this variant rule, you have to spend some downtime training or studying before you gain the benefits of a new level. I mean, that's 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 a big sentence right there. The benefits of a new level. And just that little that little section right there. Benefits of a new level. That's big. Yeah, if I can get my pen to work. So. <clears throat> Let's think about that. A variant role, you can require characters to spend downtime training or studying before they gain the benefits of a new level. If you choose this option, once a character has earned enough experience points to attain the new level, he or she must train for a number of days before gaining any class features associated with the new level. Now, what I like about the continuation of that sentence is that you're going to gain class features associated with the new level. So if you were in a dungeon and you went from third to fourth level or fifth to sixth level, and let's say at sixth level you get some stuff, you could gain your hit points because that's not a class feature necessarily. So it could be argued that you could gain hit points so that you are, you know, you're, you're in the dungeon and you gain those hit points, but you're not going to all of a sudden have some epiphany while you're in the dungeon and you're going to learn these particular class features. You're going to have to go back to school when you get done and go, your instructor's going to look at it and go, man, looks like you've, you've, you've moved up. Let's, let's put you in the training program and let's, let's get you, let's get you those skills. So you could get your class features, but while you're in the dungeon, you could gain some hit points and you could get better at some of those things so that you're still gaining a benefit at the time from going up a level. But if you want to get the full features for going up that level, you're going to have to go back and train. I kind of like that, you know, in, in old D&D, &D, that's pretty much how it worked. The training time required depends on the level to be trained. As shown on the training guide, training to gain levels table. The training cost is for the total training time. So at level attained training time versus training cost, here we've got if you're second to fourth level, it's going to take 10 days and 20 gold. But if we looked up there, and Tasha's called in of everything when they talk about changing a subclass, if you were fourth level and you wanted to, or third level, let's say fourth, and you wanted to change your subclass, it's going to take you eight days and it's going to cost you 400 gold, typically, you know, based off of those. But here, we're going to spend 10 days and 20 gold just to learn the knowledge to get to that next level. So there's a huge difference here because here, if you're changing your subclass, you're really learning everything new, especially if you were higher level. If you were 10th level and you get those 10th level benefits and you decide that, hey, I'm going to change subclasses, you could do it in 20 days and 1,000 gold. Whereas here, if you were 10th level, it's going to take you... 20 days and 40 gold. So the time that we spend is the same, but it's going to be a whole lot less. So we have a huge difference here in what the training is going to be. On 231 of the Dungeon Master Guide, there's a section on training. A character might be offered special training in lieu of a financial reward. 
This kind of training isn't widely available and thus highly desirable. It presumes the existence of a skilled trainer, perhaps a retired adventurer or champion, who is willing to serve as a mentor. The trainer might be a reclusive wizard or a haughty sorcerer who owes the queen a favor, the knight commander of the king's guard, the leader of a power druid circle, a quirky monk who lives in a remote mountaintop pagoda, a barbarian chief, a warlock living among nomads as a fortune teller, or an absent-minded bard who plays, whose plays and poetry are known throughout the land. A character who agrees to training as a reward must spend downtime with the trainer. See chapter 6 for more information about downtime activities. In exchange, the character is guaranteed to receive a special benefit. So it doesn't really, you know, you can look through chapter 6 on downtime. We're going to talk about that here in, in a, what you can do for your downtime activities and training, but your DM is going to choose, if, if they brought this up, is going to choose how long you have to train. It may be one of those things where, hey, you, you came into town and between this adventure and this adventure, you only were in town for a couple weeks and you went and trained with that person and maybe you learned a sixteenth or a quarter of what you need to learn and you're going to have to continue to work on that. And it may be a couple months or three or four sessions before you finally have finished your training and have picked up that new proficiency or skill or gained that new feat. And possible training benefits include the following. Possible. Possible. So that means your DM could come up with something different than these three. So a lot of people out there once again go, well, you know, like I was in there and they gave me this and they go, well, that's a bunch of homebrew crap. No, it says right here, we're using this thing and it's possible. These are some possible training features. I could give them something else based off of the training. That's the thing about this is, is that this, anything that's not super combat related, there is there is a lot of stuff in this game that is subjective. And just because it gives the DM the ability to think of how they want to play it in their own world does not make it homebrew. Okay. That that's the deal. It's them using their imagination and seeing how they want to play it in, in their world. Or it could be that they're like, Hey, I don't really want to do that. But some character has really been on this path. And they've explained what they're going to do. And it makes sense that that character could get that. And so they go, hey, you know what? I really wasn't into doing that kind of crap before. But because of how my players are playing and they're really putting in the effort, they are putting in the effort. Maybe you've got that other group and they're not putting in any effort at all. And they're not doing that stuff. And they're like, well, hey, I want to learn how to do this. And it's like, oh, you know, like when are you guys ever doing anything to try and get somebody to help train you? Have you found that person? This stuff when it comes to training is really up to the DM. But as a player, and my whole goal is to help players be better players. And, and the first goal is to always keep your DM in the loop. And I will tell you the problem with keeping your DM in the loop is I screw myself over more often keeping my, my DM in the loop. Cause there's a lot of times I will sit down and have discussions with my DM on like how, like the thought process and during the conversation of the thought process and really kind of telling my DM like how I want to get there and what that thought process is, my DM, I can see his eyes light up because what I just told him gives him a whole hook on how we can do this and it's giving him inside knowledge. So he is the fly on the wall. He can use that shit against me. And, and, but as a player, I like it. Because I'm helping my DM out to push the narrative forward and trying to fit it into my character's thing by doing the things that are necessary to get to that point. So I'm connecting a bunch of dots to show my DM why I've worked towards this goal and, and why you know, it would be okay if they, if they came up with some way for me to be able to achieve that goal as opposed to just going to my DM and saying, hey, I'm at A and I want to be at Z but I never connected any dots. And training is, is let's look at the next one. If you thought those two were there, let's look at this one. You can spend time between adventures, learning a new language or training with a set of tools. Your DM might allow additional training options. 
First, you must find an instructor willing to teach you. The DM determines how long it takes and whether one or more ability checks are required. The training lasts for 250 days. And based off of what I did earlier, that is a year and costs one gold piece per day. So basically what you're doing is becoming an apprentice for a year but instead of getting free room and board, or possibly even free room and board and some pay for being an apprentice, you're apprenticing and you're going to pay them a gold per day. What a deal. <laughs> All right. I mean, I would rather go find somebody who would take me on as an apprentice because maybe I have some other skills that I can help them and I use those skills to kind of pay for my being an apprentice and then they give me free room and board or whatever the situation is. I did find you know, where they, some, some talk about, you know, if it's a simple skill, it may only take a hundred days. If it's a complex skill, it's going to take 250. If you want to accurately learn how to use cartography tools and actually be able to draw a map that's actually representative of what the deal is, it's probably going to take you a year of working with a master cartographer to learn how to use those tools properly. My character is learning jeweler's tools. And you may think, well, you know, okay, you, you get a jeweler's loop and you look through it and it magnifies what you're looking at. Every single person on the plane can open up a jeweler's loop, look through it and go, yep, I can see stuff, but that doesn't mean you know what you're looking at. And think about this. Let's say the jeweler you're working with specializes in diamonds. So, you know, you work with that person, that trainer, and you're going to know a lot about diamonds. You're going to know about what their flaws are, or what the inclusions are, but then you run across some opal. Opal is a totally different beast. Just because you know how to use a jeweler's loop and you can look at it and you know how to run light through it does not mean you understand what you're looking at. You're looking at rubies or you're looking at some other type of gem. So maybe to get a, a well-rounded deal, maybe if you're just focusing on one, it takes a little bit less time. But if you're really trying to get a well-rounded education about gems, it may take you a year. And even then, you still may run across something that you've never ran across. So we have things that focus on training. But if you look at the, the, what's in the books on training, there's a huge difference between all of these. Now, I really like training. I really like the fact that if you want to learn something, and you want to go up that you've got to it's got to be you know you can work with your dm on training it and it makes great great adventures you know you're looking for that person or you're trying to find that person that has some knowledge you've heard that somebody has especially up here on the one where you could get the special training you've discovered that somebody has some spell and maybe it's an unusual spell or it's a different way of doing it where they've combined two things or it's some old knowledge spell some old world spell and you're trying to gain that knowledge and get that information and having to go train and maybe they make you go on some quest or they make you do something or it's impossible to find them or they're in a dungeon and you got to break them loose in order to get them out and then return you're like okay hey look i got you out and now you're going to teach me this spell there's all kinds of things that you can do with training and i know if you're playing really combat heavy D D where there's in the downtime it's we don't have our downtime is basically going in and spending our gold and get, replenishing our equipment and drinking and carousing. And then when we're done, we're right back out on the road and we're going to go back out to another dungeon. Or if you're playing more of the role playing side where maybe the dungeon stuff is occasionally, but the downtime stuff is most of the time, you're going to have more, more ability to train. But if your characters want some of that stuff, you know, forcing them to go, Hey, if you want that stuff, you guys are going to have to quit. It's not that we're, not getting an adventuring we're still playing D&D we're role playing more you're going to have to spend some more downtime you're going to have to invest the time and the energy to be able to do that but anytime you hear the word training in D&D and you're like well that's different than my last it's different than that your last DM because it's different it's subjective it's up to the DM to determine how that training is going to affect you and how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost all right, just a little bit on uh, training. I like training. I think we should um, all spend some time, some spend some time making our characters better. All right, thanks for watching again. If you like the video, hit hit like. If you like the channel, hit subscribe. And if you 
want to get notifications, you got to ring that bell. Thanks for watching.